Welcome to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show here on STV2. At the main talking points on tonight's programme. Brendan Rodgers denies talks with Marseille for Dembele. Billy Mackay joins Ross County. And Dundee United land Scott McDonald. Yeah, just a few of the headlines we'll be discussing on Tuesday night's programme here on STV2. Alan Roth is alongside me, Peter Martin. I'm delighted to say our bootroom guest is former Airdrionians and Glasgow City manager Eddie Vilecki Black. Um, lots to talk about with Eddie, not only in his uh, personal situation, but professionally as well. Um, so we'll discuss that with Eddie. You can interact with us on the programme. Uh, give us your thoughts on your favourite team at Peter and Ruffy on Twitter and Facebook. Facebook.com forward slash Peter and Ruffy. Um, Tuesday's papers, what about the headlines? Let's have a look at uh, what dominated the back pages of the newspapers this morning. Uh, the Daily Record, the main headline there, we won't budge. This is uh, actually Ann Budge talking about the SPFL. Look as if they'll be um, not taking it any further with regards to some form of review on Rangers' use of EBTs. And also there's a little side uh, banner there on Celtic getting tough with the Green Brigade. And the Sun... Um, Musa won't say no to Marseille is the back page headline um, and the SPFL tell Jer's title probe is scrapped and up the top is reference to 20 years ago today Henrik Larsson signed for Celtic possibly a candidate for one of the uh, best imports in the Scottish game you might agree or disagree uh, so there's the uh, mail as well. And uh, again, it goes with the no fresh probe by the SPFL into the EBTs. And with that in mind, uh, Ruffy, as I suggested to you yesterday, <coughs> I get the, the feeling that even if the SPFL decide not to pursue this, I think there's a group of supporters right across all the clubs in Scotland mm -hmm. who are going to force it out with their hands anyway. Yeah, uh, it will be uh, driven by, by other sources. Whatever clubs think that is, they, they should pursue it. Uh, obviously, everybody has a different opinion of, a, uh, of what went on then. And uh, you're right, the unfortunate thing is it's going to drag on and drag on. You know, and as we said yesterday, we want to be talking about football. We want to be talking about how good it is, how good the games are, the standard is. If we're continually talking about things off the part like that, I think it just takes it away from Scottish football. Yeah, it is a football show though, Ruffy. Still, we won't fudge it when somebody eventually no, makes no. a decision on it. I think the one thing that uh, probably irks a number of people is uh, the lack of clarity um, and, you know, a decision eventually to be made, whether it's made by the SPFL, SFA, or indeed some European governing body, whether that's mm. UEFA or the Court of Administration for Sport, um, it's, it, it's going to go on and on for quite a while yet, I get the feeling. Um, but that's one aspect of the back page headlines. The other one is this Moussa Dembele, Eddie. Um, it's one of those situations, there's no smoke sometimes without, uh, well, no smoke without fire uh, as regards to transfers. Brendan Rodgers is talking about there's no contact with Marseille and Marseille, uh, the back page headlines suggest, could be interested at 20 million. What it does say is that whatever Celtic are doing, scouting-wise, they're doing it very well because every year they seem to be bringing players who move on for vast amount of money. In the past, like Van Dijk and... Um, Wanyama. Wanyama. So... Um, I think that's the clear thing for me is that the Celtic scouting system must be operating very, very well, that they can afford to command fees like that for players who have only been at the club for a matter of months. And uh, the interesting thing is that for Celtic, is does the money they would recoup on selling him, does that cover the fact that they'll maybe lose 30 goals a year? Have they got people in place like Lee Griffiths is to go in there and take that that role? So um, I think there's a lot of discussion to be made at Celtic Park before that becomes finalised. Mm. Uh, and I think they're short mm -hmm. in the striking role, Ruffy. Yeah, well, if you're talking about uh, Lee Griffiths and see if she doesn't look as if he's in the plans at all, you would think the calibre of a, a, a team like Celtic would have at least three or four top-class strikers that they could rotate. 
and use, but who's to say? I mean, I, I think there's been some dialogue behind the scenes that we don't know about. Obviously, Brendan Rodgers has had a chat with a player and, and said, look, this is the situation. I know you might want to go, but you'll go on our terms, you know, and our terms are we want to be in the group stages and you'll be here until that happens. But if a bid comes in that's acceptable to us and to you, then we'll do everything in your way uh, to, to, to let them go. But they certainly need to be some some strikers coming in. Yep, um, and uh, Scott McDonald, the Celtic captain, <coughs> was speaking today ahead, uh, uh, Scott Brown, I beg your pardon, uh, was speaking today ahead of that match against Rosenberg tomorrow night at Celtic Park. He reckons uh, maybe another season under Brendan Rodgers would help develop uh, Dembele's career even further. I think your first season coming to a club as big as Celtic and probably just not understanding how big the club was and to score a hat trick in a uh, Rangers Celtic match and from him going from there to what he is now, he's a top quality player and he, he he's gonna thrive off that and underneath this manager he's gonna get better. Yeah, we've got a great manager and if he stays here he would definitely will improve underneath him. Yeah, the big dilemma, Eddie, is do you strike while the iron's hot or if you in your management role, would you turn around and say to him, Look, give us another year, there's a risk. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're quite right because as many clubs suffered, f turned down really good bids for a player only to find that player out of contract or out of form or injured within a short period of time and then you're sitting there ruining your decision. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as far as the uh, other news surrounding Celtic, this is of course uh, regarding the Green Brigade. Um, they've got a two-match <coughs> ban. There's uh, further bans um, from the newspaper reports this morning uh, in the away match against Sunderland, the friendly, and the away tie in uh, Norway against Rosenberg as well. So, with that in mind, um, Brendan Rodgers came out today with a strong message for the Green Brigade and anyone else who wants to fly uh, paramilitary banners or indeed the flares which is uh, getting Celtic into trouble at the moment. Celtic Football Club, as I've always been aware uh, of its heritage, of its charitable work and of its football work, that's what Celtic is and what it was started in 1888 and what it is to this very day. Celtic is not a political arena for any supporters to come into uh, and display any sort of political element. Um, and it is based around football. Um, so for me, it's my message is, they're absolutely brilliant in the support, in their enthusiasm. These guys waking up in the morning, the, the first waking moments about Celtic, they think about Celtic day and night. They think of the great ways of which you know all the, you know all the other symbols and banners that are put out, you know which are absolutely, you know the work that goes into it is admirable really, and then the energy that they bring, it, it's it's great, but we don't need to go down the other route. I think you should be commended for saying that, uh, mm -hmm. Ruffy. Quite simply, sometimes you can get caught up in your own importance in this one. I think the Green Brigade are indeed colourful. Um, certainly they put a lot of energy into it, but there's a negative element to it. And, uh, and if they continually, as a club, get mm -hmm. fined, eventually, sooner or later, UFO will say, wait a minute, you've had non-stop fines in European football, we're going to ban you in a couple of games. Yeah, and that's where you've got to get through to the supporters. That's the way it's going, you know, and that's why <coughs> Celtic have come out so strongly. Uh, Brendan's right. We all know what they bring to the game itself over 90 minutes. Uh, uh, just everything, the, the noise uh, that they bring, the banners, again, if they're correctly done, uh, are fantastic for neutrals to see. Uh, and, and they are a large part of, of the club. But at the end of the day, if, if it continues to go the way it's going, the larger part of the club are the ones who are going to get punished. No, they're the ones that are going to get shut down or not allowed to go to a European game or whatever. So you've got to think of the bigger picture. And we all know what they bring, but you've got to think of the other 59,000 that's at the game as well. Yeah, and of course, it's something that Celtic have pioneered in the safe standing area as well. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, I mean, it's bouncing. The atmosphere is magnificent. But... There are a couple of occasions when I just think they've let the club down. Yeah, and I think recently the banners that went up at the, the previous European game was there for everybody to see that uh, you have to call a halt, you know, and uh, and just 
move on and, and just do what you're good at. Yep. OK, um, that's 20 years ago. A certain Henrik Larsson signed for uh, Celtic. Um, but I wonder if you can answer our question about the famous number seven. After the break, we're going to talk about Aberdeen in Europe. We're going to talk to Eddie Vilecki Black about the future for him. Welcome back to Peter and Ruffy's football show here on STV2. We started back, Ruffy, uh, last night. Holidays go so quickly and then you're right back into it, day two. Yeah, uh, the good thing about it is we've got football uh, happening, uh, the Betfred, and coming quick and fast and it's going to get more and more exciting as the as the tournament goes on. Yep, absolutely, and it's the, it's the time of season where I think uh, each and every fan looks at all the forms of media to find out which players are coming to join your club. Some are just red herrings, I'm almost certain sometimes we <laughs> go into a darkened room, Ruffy, and throw a dart and come up with a player's name, uh, but some will actually come to fruition. Uh, Eddie Vilecki Black is our boot room guest tonight. Delighted that Eddie is with us. Um, the career um, is, I think, stalled at the moment, as far as you're concerned, Eddie. Um, but when you look back at what you achieved with Glasgow City, uh, first and foremost, um, that must fill you with a great sense of pride. Yeah, when you look back on it now, and uh, the subsequent manager um, has saw how difficult it is to maintain a winning mentality at the club and keep the trophies coming in, so it makes it a partner, it's not as easy as people imagine. From your own point of view, I mean, I think the desire, um, no disrespect to the, the women's game, but when you get that success, there's, there was a niching, and I could tell at the time when I was talking to you and you were the manager there, to get into the men's game where you'd played, I think you played Montrose as well, yeah. um, to get back into management in the men's game. Yeah, yeah, I think that was always in the back of mind. I'd managed at Montrose, where I'd played, I'd gone back there as manager. And uh, I felt that I had unfinished business in the men's game. And I was just looking for that next opportunity to get back in. And uh, for as much success as I was getting in the women's game, I felt that um, I maybe wasn't getting noticed. And therefore I was desperate to go back in and try and prove that the things I'd learned in the women's game, I was able to translate them to the men's game. Did you feel when, <clears throat> the, obviously you, you had a time at Edge of Sport as well, but did you feel when you got the Airdrie job that that was starting to click, that was that was exactly the way you wanted things to go? I did initially because um, the chairman had trusted me to put in place a philosophy for the whole club. So I worked really hard at that and uh, the coaches bought into it very quickly. Um, it meant me spending... Once a week, I'd, I'd bring the coaches in and I'd explain the philosophy of the club now and they'd go through training plans, training sessions, etc. and what we expected to see on days, match days. So um, it was a lot of hard work, but it was very enjoyable work. Yeah, the one thing that I think surprised me, um, having spoken to you on previous occasions at Glasgow City, and then to, to read the story of that fateful day, you're the manager, you, you're in charge of a game, Take us through what happened to you. All the time there's been this um, this desire for Airdrie to be in the top four. And uh, ironically, we played Cowden Beath that day, away from home. And there was nothing untoward about preparation. I mean, it was fine. We did our training throughout the week. We were on a half-decent run at the time. Uh, we'd went to Dunfermline and they'd gone unbeaten for about, I don't know, six, seven months. We went there on a Friday night, a live TV game in 1-1-0, one, and deservedly so, may I say. And uh, I felt the team was just now beginning to turn. And they couldn't be the game. Just approaching half-time, I about turned <coughs> and went in the, in the dressing room. And I did this wherever I was. I'd go into the toilet just to pull myself together and to have five minutes to get my thoughts on what I was going to speak to the players about and check my notes. And I would only take notes if I felt there was something tactically in the game that needed attended to. So I used to always ask myself three questions every time. What's wrong, who's involved, and how do I fix it? 
that's what I was opening with three questions. So I was in the toilet, and uh, as I went to wash my hands, I couldn't have turned the tap on. And that's what triggered me, something was wrong. So I went outside, I saw the physio, Kirsty Hamilton, the sister. Some, I don't feel too good. She went, what's wrong with you? I said, I don't know, I just don't feel too good. And she, I don't know what it was that triggered it in her, but she says to me, come here, and she pulled me in the side room. She gave me a couple of tests with my arms up, put both arms up, I couldn't do it. So she obviously very quickly realised something was seriously wrong. She then contacted the cow doctor. Now, as you know, SPFL games, there has to be a doctor available at all home matches by the home club. So the the doctor came down from Cairn Beath, uh, he was sitting in a stand or wherever, and he assessed me, and uh, he was immediately on the phone to the hospital. And within, I think it was 30 minutes, had passed from the physio diagnosing me as being a stroke victim to um, me being in the hospital. And uh, they had me in the ambulance, and they were undergoing tests in the ambulance. And I was taken to Edinburgh Hospital. And I was very fortunate that I um, ended up in probably the best hospital for strokes uh, at the time. And the quickness of, they say the first hour is vital. So I was in that, within that first hour. Is it a day, I mean, you, you, you can recall it so clearly. <clears throat> From there, you, you kind of obviously would suspect there's going to be a long road back um, to football, but you mentioned there the, the, the speed in which everybody assessed what was wrong with you. Um, the thing that triggered it was high blood pressure. That clearly comes with the pressures of the job. Is it something you think maybe managers right across all four divisions should be aware of and should get checked regularly? Absolutely. 100%. Because... Um, I was unaware that I had high blood pressure. And um, nowadays I have to go once a month to my, my local GP and get checked over. I take tablets every day and I probably will do for the rest of my life to keep my blood pressure controlled. And uh, I think that in the sport that we put so much money into the sport throughout Britain, that a wee thing like maybe a blood pressure getting checked for a manager before a game or even maybe players during the week. That could save a life. If it saves one life, then it's worth it. Two points I want to make to you, and <coughs> obviously we can't speak about <clears throat> your situation with Airdrie because um, it's an ongoing um, legal situation. But as far as getting back involved in the game, mm -hmm. is it something that you see in the future? Is it something that's driving you on? Definitely, 100%. As I said, my first ever managerial job was at Lock United. I was 32 then. I'm 52 now, so that's 20 years ago. So realistically, Pierre, I don't know anything better. To be honest, that's all I know. For the last 20 years, that's all I've done has been in management. And I still analyse games to this day. I watch all the football on television to keep myself involved. Um, I love tactical matches that are on the go. I love studying them and seeing... How would I do that differently? What could I do to help that if I was in that situation of that manager? So um, my brain's still there, it's still sharp. Even though it was damaged in the stroke, I know it was a massive, it was a brain hemorrhage I took, it was massive. And uh, I know how fortunate I am when I, I realised that people like Davy Cooper had the same thing and died on the spot. So I realised how lucky I've been. But I still feel I've got a lot to give back to the game still. Now, as far as the physical part of this, um, Eddie, you're, I think your wife has to receive tremendous praise as well as yourself. You're reading up on it. You know that it's a long road back as far as getting the physio, getting um, yourself active and obviously trying to um, repair some of the, the, the damage. What's the process for you now? The process is I'm currently... A friend of mine decided that he wanted to raise some funds to send me abroad to America where there's some treatment that has proved to be revolutionary. And uh, my wife jumped on the back of that, and you're actually quite correct that she has been an incredible source of inspiration to me. And uh, I can't fault the support I've had from family and friends. And she looked into it. She phoned America, spoke to consultants and that over there, and 
she got the figures back and the figures were going to be £10,000 to send me over there to try for this treatment. So far, I think we're at roughly around about £6,000, £7,000. Uh, there's a GoFund page that people can donate, etc. And uh, it has proved that many people have gone over there and saw... Um, some have saw significant change and some have maybe saw less profound effects. But for me, I believe that if I get 1% difference, then that will change my life. Well, listen, um, from our point of view, um, you can go on uh, Eddie's Twitter page and find out how you can get involved in that. And uh, obviously you'll be able to read up on so much more of... Uh, the medical aid that can help uh, the likes of Eddie and others. His Twitter account is at edblack65, uh, at edblack65, and uh, you can help, maybe even a, a donation, uh, and see if you can get that trip to America. More from Eddie Vilecki Black after the break. Welcome back to Peter and Ruffy's football show here on STV2. After that short break, Alan Ruff is alongside me, Peter Martin. Our bit room guest is Eddie Vallecki Black, the former Glasgow City and Airdrionians manager. Um, I'll throw in Montrose as well now because I completely forgot all about that, Eddie. Um, signings, players coming in and coming out, that's always the exciting part of it, mm -hmm. right up until uh, the window closes, Ruffy. I personally think the window should close the minute you start kicking a ball in the first Premier League game, but it goes further than that now. Yeah, it certainly does. Uh, I, I, I prefer it just now than the, the window, you know, in, in January, because obviously clubs with the financial clout use it to their <coughs> you lose it to their advantage. But you're right, the start of every season, you know, it doesn't matter what club you're at, supporters want to pick up the paper and see a player that's coming to the club. It just excites everybody. And certainly some of the clubs that you're just about to tell us have done that, you know, because a lot of them have experienced what they actually need to get them out of where they are. Yeah. And uh, that's a big telling point. Well, I had a chat with um, Scott McDonald uh, in the summer. He was still undecided, the possibility of going home. Um, but again, Dundee United must have uh, got in there, Eddie, and, and turned his head to keep him here in Scotland. Yeah. I think it's a fantastic signing for Dundee United. And on the back of Fraser Fivey, James Keatons and Sam Stanton, I think United are going to be in a strong position this year to compete for, uh, a, if not an automatic promotion slot, then certainly through the playoffs. And being a Dundee lad, I hope so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, having been on holiday with a few people from Dundee in the summer, I've got to ask you... <laughs> Are you a Dundee United fan? <laughs> Were you brought up a United fan? Because I have never met a city like it, Ruffy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was a family there and they were split down the middle. You know, it was uh, United or, or Dundee mm -hmm. and they are passionate about it. I totally get mm -hmm. why nobody should suggest the two clubs should merge. Yeah. <coughs> I was a um, Dundee United fan most of the days and I was fortunate enough that, that the team that I watched were a fantastic side. And my boyhood hero growing up was Paul Sterlick. And he was a fabulous player for the club. I'm glad you said that, Ruffy mm -hmm. Sturrock. The only man who must have had mm -hmm. steel ankles for the <laughs> boots that he took yeah. on them because there is a guy who could hold the ball in. Anybody from a throw in, he'd hold it in. Mm -hmm. He could lay it off. I thought he was a magnificent player. Yeah, and I think Paul Sturrock was one of the, the, the players, the early players that uh, everybody was crying out for protection for strikers, mm -hmm. and particularly Jim McLean, the manager. And he did take a baton. But uh, you have to say uh, and give him credit that he always got up you know, he wasn't one of these players that was rolling about the ground. You know, he just took what he got and got on with the game and scored goals. And uh, Jock Steen was a big fan of his. You know, he brought him into the Scotland squad uh, when there was a lot of bigger name strikers out there. But he saw uh, what he could do up front. He was a different kind of striker from most of the other ones and uh, certainly scored his fair share of goals. Mm. And McDonald for you? Yes, I think uh, I think Dundee United have obviously tasted the disappointment of, of last year and they want to go one better. They're, they're signing a player with quality, European experience, goals everywhere he's went and uh, he will lift the dressing room. He's that kind of player. He seems to have 
you know, that in him, you know, that players respond to him round about. But I, I do think he needs a foil uh, to play with. He usually plays off a big striker. I don't know if Dundee United have got that, but certainly got Keatons and we saw what Keatons did with Hibs. Any time he was given the chance, he came on and scored. His ratio of uh, scoring goals as a substitute must be very, very high and that's why they've signed him. Yeah, I think it's a big season for United. That division is so difficult to get out of, Eddie. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the proof's there if you look over the last three or four years when Rangers, Hibs and Hearts. I think that's a big thing though is for Dundee United. There isn't Hibs, Rangers or Hearts in that league to compete with. It's almost um, a free run without any of them. I mean, because that's three that are arguably the biggest club in the country. So they don't have that to contend with. But what they do have is a very, very strong Morton team. Because I know Jim Duffy very well and I, I like the way he works. I think he's got always got a really competitive team. So it's no, it's no a foregone conclusion that Dundee United will get out of that league this year. Yeah, um, as far as um, uh, other signings are concerned, Ruffy, I'm just looking at some of the, the, the deals that are being done. Um, one of them caught me by surprise today, which was uh, Billy Mackay to Ross County mm. from Wigan, because uh, they obviously had him out on loan, uh, not only at Dundee United, mm. but uh, they had him out on loan at his old club Inverness. Yeah, I think we all remember the fantastic season he had. You know, uh, I don't know how many goals he scored, but it was a large amount, and, and it opened everybody's eyes up to him. That's why he obviously went to England. Obviously, some players, you know, particularly strikers, go off a year or two basically because the teams that they go to don't play to the style of him, you know, you have to play around about him. And when you see, uh, I think when he went to Dundee United, you could see he was maybe a wee half a yard, he was making runs that were other players weren't seeing, you know, and that, it never worked for him. But I just think he's a player going to the right club with the right players around about him. Uh, will just click again and I think he'll get back up like all good strikers do, hitting the back of the net and that's why obviously they've signed him because they see something in him. Do you read him, Eddie? Scott McDonald. Yeah, um, very. Okay. Um, Mackay? Oh, Billy Mackay, sorry, yes. Yes, Billy Mackay I think will do a fantastic job for Dundee United. He played against my Airdrie team in the Scottish Cup just over maybe a year and a half ago Yeah. and uh, at that time Mixu played one up and two behind. Billy Mackay played one of those two behind and uh, he was so difficult to pin down. He was a clever striker, made really good runs and um, created space really well for himself and for his teammates. And uh, I think they've won a watch United getting him in. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, Ross, Ross County. County Ross yeah. County, yeah. Um, and of course, just picking up on that point, um, here's Jim McIntyre on the aforementioned player. Bill, he's a player that we obviously know well and he's previously done very well uh, across at Inverness and we feel he, he's the right type of player you know he's a proven goal scorer at this level and we're losing Liam and losing 24 goals out our side I'm sure and Billy can help uh, bridge that gap along with the three other strikers you know he had a knack of scoring goals against Ross County for Dundee United and Inverness so uh, you know as long as he puts the ball in the back of the net I'm sure the punters will get right behind him I, I now feel we've got really good balance in terms of different types of strikers. You know, Billy is definitely a poacher uh, style striker, and you know we're looking forward to working with him. Yeah, no pressure. Just fill Liam mm -hmm. Boyce's yeah. bits. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean uh, we have we saw what Boyce did uh, last year and the year before. Uh, it's a big. Uh, Bit to fill, but I, I think Billy Mackay's got it in him. Uh, I think he's a goal scorer. Uh, he's sharp running about the box. Ross County, a lot of their goals are in the 18-yard box, and, and that's where he's just got that wee half a yard. Uh, I, I would expect him maybe to go there and score 15 goals. Yeah, I mean, they finished seventh in the table, yeah. and, and I think great credit to... Sometimes it's a bonus. If you're a manager, Eddie, and you've got a board uh, that back you, Roy McGregor has put his money where his yeah. mouth is. Yeah, I mean, I've spoke to many people in the game and Roy McGregor has a, a really good reputation for backing his managers. And also I'd say on the Billy Mackay thing is that sometimes the making of a player is the coaching system that's in place here. And I believe that we, Jim McIntyre and Billy, Billy Dodds, I think he's got a great learning place. And I think he's, his game will improve massively working with him. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are undoubtedly uh, more deals afoot. I think we've got to wait, Rafi, <coughs> until we get to, you know, uh, close to that window closing before I think we lay our cards on the table and who we think's going to win <laughs> each division because <laughs> look at me last mm -hmm. season with Peter Head. I tipped them yeah. to win that division and they get relegated. So, you know, I mean, there are so many that can catch mm -hmm. you out. And again, I, I mentioned earlier... Um, you know, Peter Head might have lost a, a League Cup game, but their chairman uh, is throwing money at Jim McAnally to get them back up again. Yeah, I think he has to. You know, I think the disappointment in the last year uh, was there for everybody to see. So it's good. You know, Jim does a fantastic job up there, and it's good now that the, the owner has, has decided to back him. Obviously, he's a supporter as well. He won't want them to get through another season of what they went through last year. So. Let's see what he brings in as well. Yeah, we're going to hear from uh, Derek McInnes on tomorrow night's programme, um, Ruffy, just looking ahead to that uh, match against Apollon Limassol. Aberdeen, I thought it was a great result in the last round. Mm -hmm. You know, once we hear Derek's thoughts on it, um, I, I noticed that a number of the Aberdeen players have mentioned they're not a team, a separate side to be underestimated, but mm -hmm. you would hope Aberdeen could get through and group stages mm -hmm. would be great for the Dons. Yeah, we keep saying it. We, we want more and more Scottish clubs uh, being in Europe longer and obviously it helps the coefficient as well. I certainly think the more games that they play and, and not the more disappointments that they get in Europe, they'll learn from it. Uh, and it is a different style. Sometimes you have to set your stall out to just take what you can get and move on. Uh, I would like to think at home particularly they, they would be more impressive You know, if they get the chance to be more comfortable and, and make it easier for them when they go away if it's a way of tie second. But uh, they've certainly, got, I think, got a better side this year. Uh, they just need to click. Yeah, absolutely. A um, couple of goals and a clean sheet for the Dons on Thursday night would be absolutely fantastic. OK, uh, coming up after the break, we're going to give you the answer to the Henrik Larsson question, if you haven't got it already, that is. Uh, and we'll look at the great man himself. £650,000 uh, seems like a bargain, Ruffy. Yeah, I would say so. Uh, if it was modern day, it would be a lot, <laughs> lot more than that. Then uh, obviously Celtic wouldn't be able to afford them. But uh, they got them at the right time. Uh, I think uh, the agent or the, whoever spotted them and took the gamble to bring them, it wasn't a gamble. Uh, when he came here, I think he just opened everybody's eyes up. And uh, from a neutral point of view as well, uh, it was just a joy to watch. You know, any grounds he went to, he just had that wee bit special. And uh, the longer he was here, the better he got. And some of the goals, if, uh, if you get a chance to see a monologue of them, they're, they're absolutely stunning. I don't mm. think there's any tap-ins. Yeah, um, of course, um, Vim Janssen... Uh, takes a lot of credit for it, Eddie and Rob Janssen mentioned the fact that Celtic actually were able to quickly trigger the £650,000 buyout clause, which Feyenoord were far from happy with, but, you know, took advantage of it and yeah. got their man. They did, and uh, you'd, you could easily argue a case for him being the best player ever to play in this country. And at that, that amount of money, it, it, it's, as Ruffy said, it's staggering to think what he'd be worth today. Yeah, well, I, I'll, I'll offer you this suggestion, Ruffy. If uh, Romelu Lukaku mm -hmm. <laughs> is worth up in the 80s and the 90 million, then Henrik Larsson, mm -hmm. I would suggest to you from anything from asking Sir Alex Ferguson to Ronald Dino, uh, so many of his teammates, mm -hmm. Jerry Henry, I think they'd all agree he'd be up there. Yeah, I think if you're, if you're good enough to go into a Man United side uh, at the level they were at and then also go to Barcelona, you know, uh, with the players that they had, you are talking that kind of money. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And uh, although everybody says oh, people don't respect you because you're just scoring goals in Scotland, he had the ability to go to Barcelona and Man United and do just everything he was doing. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what figure I could put on it, but it certainly be a lot of millions. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the Celtic fans remember him with great fondness.
Yep, Henrik Larsson uh, joining the club uh, 20 years ago. It's just flashed by. Um, this is actually what he said on the day he signed. How do you see this move then as far as your career is concerned? Uh, I think it's a very good move for me. I think uh, I've been long enough in Holland, so I have to try something new. And Celtic, Celtic uh, looks like a very good club, club so uh, I think it's going to do good to my uh, further uh, development as a player and as a human being. I think you got it right, Ruffy, <laughs> to, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, listen, uh, when you look back over certain things, I mean, you know what I'm like. I like to look at the papers, Eddie, and, and pick up little nuggets every now and then that I can throw mm -hmm. at your man here sitting mm -hmm. next to you. Um, and this one I thought was great in the Sunday Times, Ruffy. I meant to bring it in yesterday, um, but uh, I took it out of the paper this morning as well. Um, and there was actually... Um, a, a, you know how they come up with these stamps mm -hmm. to commemorate mm -hmm. things? Uh, there was actually a stamp commissioned by the Royal Mail um, potentially to cover Scotland winning the World Cup in 1978. I mean, look at that, Ruffy. Had you and your cronies <laughs> <laughs> not blown it for us and been arguing right, left and centre, that mm -hmm. could have been you alongside your mm -hmm. teammates. I mean, we, we believed, we paid a tenner to wave you yeah. off. We thought you were going to win yeah. the World Cup. Yeah, they've been great. I mean, nowadays we would just be bringing out a stamp to get there. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but no, there was obviously another stamp commissioned. It's, uh, it's one where we've all got our jackets over our head <laughs> coming back on the plane. But no, it would have been great, but uh, it just never happened. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a, I looked at it in the paper and I picked it up and I thought, oh, there we are, it's... Uh, it's a special stamp collection they're showing at a museum in London, and that is one of them, which is absolutely fantastic. And I know, Eddie, because you're in a similar age group to myself, you must have been devastated when Ruffy and the team let us down. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the game that sticks in mind is not the run game, but actually the Peru game. Because at that time, me personally, I thought it was a walkover for us. I thought it was a gimme three points, no problem. And then we showed at the end of the tournament the capabilities we had as a, as a team by beating a very, very good Holland team. I mean, Archie's a great goal. And got our hopes up at 3-1. Yeah. Only needed one more goal. Mm. And who knows, I might have been licking those stamps. <laughs> yeah. Just out of curiosity, Eddie, can you go back over the three things that you always put in your notes um, as a manager? What were they again? And my, the three things was that I, it was the same three questions: who's in, what's wrong, who's involved, and how do I fix it? Yeah, absolutely, Ruffy. So you're, just, you're, just leading, you're just leading him into that second goal at home. <laughs> You can see it coming, Robbie, can't you? I mean, Eddie, but Eddie had been in the dugout and he went, 30 yards, Johnny Rep. Come on, Ruffy, have a one with yourself. Oh, that's absolutely priceless. Um, I'll tell you something else that's put me on a downer, Ruffy, and I mentioned it because we always like to talk about English football as well on the programme. It's going to be the first mm. season since the, uh, you know, the uh, arrival of the Premier League as we know it now, uh, way back in 1992. It's the first season without a Scottish manager in the top flight of English football, which mm. I think is a sad, sad day. Yeah, it certainly is. I mean, you can go back mm. uh, to the Tommy Doherty's and the George Graham's and the, the Shankleys and they were everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And then modern day, obviously, Kenny Dalglish and Graham and the lads, you know, and maybe Sir Eddie, Alex. Sir Alex, maybe Eddie can give us a better viewpoint and, and, and why that is the case, that there is no longer any managers there. We had a few in the, the championship, but uh, they didn't seem to work for them either. There seems to be um, certainly an influx of foreign managers going into the Premiership. So it's like, like most things in life, there's always um, these times when something that's a current thing to trend. The current trend is maybe Scotland managers and then it goes to foreign managers, whether they're Spanish or Italian. And I, I can't, I don't know why, but it maybe tells us when you see that the lack of Scottish managers, there's certainly a lack of Scottish players there as well. Yeah. And maybe that'll explain why, as a nation, when maybe no competing so well on the international front, even although I've, I'm very optimistic under Gordon Strachan. Yeah, I mean, there is. I mean, there's no doubt, there's no 
point in fudging it. I mean, I think there's a general disdain uh, towards Scottish football, certainly from our English counterparts. Although I would suggest to you now, Ruffy, it's not any better for England. They only have four mm -hmm. managers in the top flight of the football. It's exactly what Eddie's talking about. Mm -hmm. If there's a fad, if there's a, a cycle that goes on, uh, I mean, uh, I'm looking at it, Shakespeare, Howe, Clement and Dyche, and mm -hmm. that's it. Mm -hmm. the, the others are Welsh and Irish. You know, and I think that's why uh, Southgate's got the job, you know, because generally mm -hmm. they were going for fantastically foreign names, you know, and for whatever reason, you know, they, they were getting less and less talked about and, and talked about, rather, you know, with Ericsson and everything, the press and the media, and a lot of people were saying, well, foreign's not maybe the, the route we go around. International way, yeah. uh, it certainly hasn't stopped them, as Eddie said, bringing them into the English. Premature. I'll tell you one thing that I'm going to be looking at, Ruffy, is how many home-based players actually start games in the English Premier League and here in Scotland. I'll be keeping a close eye on how many Scottish players actually start uh, in their sides this season in the top flight in Scotland as well. It'll be interesting to see. Yeah, it is, and if it does go the trend that you're predicting there, it's unfortunate for the younger players in the game, young players who are trying to break through, a lot of them with a lot of ability, but just not getting the chance for that reason. Yeah. Um, uh, Eddie, it's been an absolute joy having you on the programme. I genuinely hope you get back into uh, the game when we have you on here as a manager of a particular club. Um, uh, and again, if you can go back over the Twitter account that people can actually yeah. you know, log into and find out about your deal. OK. The Twitter account is at Eddie Black 65 and uh, the GoFund page is actually a pinned tweet. So as soon as they enter that Twitter account, they will see that um, fund there. That'll be the first thing they should see on my page. So. Brilliant, absolutely. Great to have uh, Eddie Vallecki Black as our bootroom guest. Hopefully you can get on there to Ed Black 65 and uh, see what you can do as well. From Ruffy and myself, good night.